Welcome back to Worldview. Now, yesterday we visited with Alan Cairns, the Tory MP for the Vale of Glamorgan, and we talked a little bit about the murder of uh, gunner Lee Rigsby in South London. Today we wanted to dive a bit deeper into some of the security issues we face as a result of this gruesome case. Also, breaking news earlier today seems to suggest that a firebombing early this morning at a Somali Muslim center is linked to the English Defense League, or EDL, and violence against Muslims seems to be on the rise across Britain. Joining us today on the program is Paul Rogers. He is Professor of Peace Studies at Bradford University in Northern England, and he worked originally in the biological and environmental sciences, including, lecture, including lecturing at Imperial College London, but has worked for the past 35 years on international security. He's a consultant to Oxford Research Group, an independent UK think tank, and writes a weekly analysis of international security issues for www.opendemocracy.net. The most recent of his 26 books are Global Security and the War on Terror, Elite Security and the Illusion of Control, and the third edition of Losing Control, Global Security in the 21st Century. Paul and I were on a China Radio International panel this Monday talking about this very subject, and I invited him to visit with us today. Paul Rogers, welcome to Worldview. Great, Dennis. Great to be here. Thanks for joining us. Now, Paul, we seem to be seeing an escalation in the amount of violence aimed at Muslims, as well as broader disenfranchisement issues in that community, leading to the radicalization of a very small group of young men. Where do you see the situation today, and how is it unfolding? Well, the situation is that we've had a, quite a big increase on attacks on Muslims, and two instances of quite serious attacks on mosques. The most serious, as you said today, was a mosque, what well, is actually a community center with a prayer room, which was actually burnt down, burnt to the ground. It was in the Muswell Hill district of London, not an area with any kind of racial tension. And the group that ran the center was a Somali group, quite well integrated. And one of the interesting things was that after this uh, attack and the destruction of the uh, center, a lot of people from other faiths and other ethnic groups came to support them. There was a very interesting scene recorded where the local rabbi came to express his solidarity. So this wasn't in an area of high tension, but obviously it is national headlines, and therefore it is stimulating further concern about the risk of an escalation. There have been a number of problems with the English Defence League, which is the main far-right streetwise group, uh, certainly in England, and that has done a lot of demonstrations, but they've not been massive, and in some ways there have also been many counter demonstrations, peace marches and the rest. So while the EDL is certainly getting a lot of publicity at present, we haven't seen a huge upsurge in violence that some people feared. And we're now, what, um, 10 days, 11 days into the situation. And one hopes that when the next weekend passes, uh, there won't be further major trouble. There may be an attempt to stir things up, but fingers crossed, so to speak, uh, things might start to ease a little bit. Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about Woolwich, <clears throat> the area where the attack occurred, and also Bradford, where you're located in, in northern England near Leeds. Now, these two metropolitan areas have been melting pots for generations of immigrants, and it seems as though everyone in together ha has lived together quite peacefully in the past. What is it that has gone so wrong now? Well, I think as far as Woolwich is concerned, it's a very multi-ethnic area. Uh, people have moved in from very, various different cultures over the last 30, 40 years. It's part of a change across the whole of London, which is now quite an intensely multicultural city, certainly more so than 50 years ago. Um, Woolwich is an uh, outer district of London, uh, near the Thames, quite industrial, not particularly wealthy, which has had relatively good community relations. And I think this particular attack was very much a one-off rather than representative of feelings within the community as a whole. It has a large barracks very near the center of the town and the military are well known in Woolwich and, and really quite well regarded. The relationship between the military and the town are generally pretty good. So I had this uh, appalling attack I don't think is illustrated of major community problems in Woolwich particularly. Now, well, if we exactly, take, right? and, and, and one can often, I mean, I often compare the work of the two madmen in Woolwich to that of the strikes of, uh, say, the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan in America. I mean, religious fanatics, so few in numbers, yet they get so much attention and make things difficult for everyone else there. What are some of the root causes of the problems that we have been seeing? Uh, the root cause of the problems, what, in terms of the reaction to Woolwich? 
Uh, it really comes from relatively small groups who are on the far right. We've had a succession in Britain of far right parties. The National Front uh, 40, 50 years ago opposed mainly to the African Caribbean immigrants coming in principally from Jamaica and some of the other Caribbean islands. Then we had the British National Party, which peaked about 10 years ago, won quite a lot of local election seats, failed dismally dismal in local politics, and basically almost got wiped out at the last election. It also had a lot of internal problems, and it has been, in a way, usurped by this English Defence League, which is more specifically anti-Muslim, uh, and really draws from relatively poor white working-class males in their 20s and 30s, who really, um, in a sense, are radicalised in terms of these extreme views because of their own circumstances. Uh, they're not necessarily strong at all in areas with large Muslim populations. For example, Bradford, the city where I work, uh, has had major problems with the EDL coming in from outside, but there isn't a major EDL presence permanently in the city. So they often tend to come from quite large urban areas, um, often large housing estates, where in fact there are not large numbers of Muslims in the immediate vicinity. Uh, so it's more a reaction to, their, a to their own circumstances in many ways. Now you were talking, mentioned Bradford in, in relation to Woolwich. Bradford is a city of nearly a third of a million. Uh, it's had a whole series of waves of immigration in, uh, going back to the Irish, the Poles after the Second World War, the Ukraines, German weavers a hundred years ago, and then in the 1950s and 60s, large numbers of Pakistanis from the Mirpur district of Pakistan, a poor district, coming into the mills. Many of them did not speak English, and we're now into the second and third generation of those families. But overall, the Pakistani origin community alone makes up getting on for 20% of the city. So it's a sizable population. There are African Caribbeans, there are Indians, the Bangladeshis, but the Pakistani population is the largest. Now, 12 years ago, uh, there was an attempt by the British National Party to run a demonstration in Bradford. Things went badly wrong with the policing, and a serious riot broke out, mainly uh, fermented by young, um, marginalized Asian youth. It's a very bad experience for the city and got it a bad reputation. Over the last 12 years, there have been very extensive efforts to have the communities working closer together. And while the city is not very successful economically, and I would never say that race relations are perfect, uh, things are certainly a lot better than they were. And Bradford also has some serious poor white housing estates, so you have an added problem there. The EDL tried to come to the city two years ago, one August Saturday, with the deliberate aim of uh, really stirring up major trouble. And it was handled in a very sophisticated way. The police allowed them in, provided they were bussed or trained in, not coming in their own vehicles, to one particular part of the city where the police could really maintain security. Uh, the city worked hard to ensure that many of the young Asian youth, uh, when they're in youth clubs, the youth clubs chose those days to take the kids out into the countryside. Um, the city really worked hard to improve community relations. There was a major civic event about a mile away from where the EDL were, and many people went to that. The end result was that apart from a period in the mid-afternoon when some EDL supporters tried to break into the city centre, which was repulsed by the police, the whole demonstration went off well and singularly failed to cause the kind of riot that they wanted. And at the end of the day, I remember seeing the EDL coaches being escorted out of the city down the local motorway and away from the county. But it's a fairly good example, and it's a rather long example, a fairly good example of how a city worked very hard and assiduously to come together. Well, and, and you know, it seems as though that seems to be happening again this time around. I mean, Paul, we use this word terrorism to describe so many things. Are we right to call the Woolwich attack terrorism? And, and how do we define what that term actually means going forward? Well, in the strict, uh, there are scores of definitions of terrorism, and there's no one which is agreed yet by the UN. But the best definitions are the simplest ones. And in that sense, the use of terror, terrorism is the use of terror or fear to have an effect in a population or community much bigger than the actual target. So in other words, you're trying to create a wider feeling of fear uh, by what you do. So in that sense, one would have to say that the Woolwich attack was a terror attack. Because while it was appalling for the young man who was killed, the intention was to have a much wider impact. And so in that sense, it was true. Let me say, though, if we're talking about terror, 
most academic experts concentrate almost exclusively on uh, sub-state terrorism, al-Qaeda, provisional IRA and the rest. Um, historically, certainly over the last hundred years, the greatest proportion of the use of terror has been by states against their own populations. Yeah. Notoriously towards the end of the uh, colonial era, more recently uh, in China, in Syria, uh, the attack on Homs about 20 years ago, uh, the activities of the Soviets with the gulags, and many, many other examples. So one could say that that is the aspect of terror, state terrorism, which is actually not researched academically anything like as much as sub-state terrorism, but affects far, far more people. Well, it's truly fascinating work that you do there, sir, and I want to thank you, Paul, for joining us here on The Worldview. Thanks very much for talking. Professor Paul Rogers is Professor of Peace Studies at Bradford University in Northern England. Now, you can follow his weekly analysis of international security issues on www.opendemocracy.net, and he is author of the book Global Security and the War on Terror, Elite Security and the Illusion of Control. You're watching Worldview with Dennis Campbell. Stay right here.